All right, we got the uh, Cowboys and Bears tonight. You can listen to the game on 97.3 ESPN. After Tony Bruno's countdown to kickoff show, Bruno and Mays live tonight, 6 to 8, getting you ready. Now, this is a big game. We'll talk more about it, get the headlines on the way. Now, they're asking this question, uh, is tonight more of a must-win for Cowboys or Bears? I don't even know how that's a conversation. I mean, this is must-win for Dallas. I mean, the Bears are out of this thing. Well, yeah, Dallas needs a win desperately. What would the must-win – how would it? How would must win factor in for the Bears at all here? I mean, unless you're saying well, Matt this, Nagy's in trouble, which I don't know. He was the coach of the year last year, was he not? I guess if they go ten and six, right? If they win out, they have a shot at uh, a wild card. Uh, no, as Jeff Pasquino told us earlier, I mean they have a shot, but they have a yeah. lot of mathematical. They need this team to win, lose stuff. Right. Uh, let's bring John McMullen in and ask him uh, why would tonight's game be somewhat of a must win for the Bears if at all why would that question be asked who's this more of a must win for uh no it's a must win for the Bears I mean the Bears remember they already beat the Vikings once they play them again week 17 uh if they win that game uh they're probably a playoff team so uh they still have a chance much like the Eagles much like the Cowboys hmm. uh if they win out uh, they would be in very good position. You have to see what the Rams do as well. But remember, that's the problem with these late-season schedules or, or the good part of these late-season schedules when the NFL went to that change a number of years ago. And that's what's going on with the Eagles. You have a lot of division games. And the Rams are in a good division. Uh, so teams are going to lose. Other teams are going to win. And if the Bears win out, they're going to make the playoff. So, yeah, it's just as must win for them. Gotcha. I guess it's because it's not as high profile as Dallas and obviously in the same division because uh, I thought that, that the Bears needed some help to be able to get in. But uh, Well, they, uh, they have to overcome a lot more because they have two teams ahead of them. Yeah. And most people project those teams as being better. Uh, but it's the same reality, whereas the Cowboys are in first place. So it's right in front. I think it's right in front of people. People understand if they keep winning, they're going to stay in first place, whereas the Bears are in third place and have to jump over at least one of those two teams, and they're not going to jump over the Packers. So it would have to be the Vikings, and they already beat the Vikings once and have them on their schedule again. So there's still a lot of hope in Chicago. Uh, it probably ends if they lose this game now. So it, right. it is a must-win game for that. Well, you can hear it tonight on 97.3 ESPN. It's a big game, obviously, for Eagles fans. Uh, give us your thoughts on tonight. Dallas, we know, has not beat a team with a winning record. Now they're playing a team with a 500 record. Uh, it's on the road here. So kind of give us your thoughts on what you see in the game because, obviously, Eagle fans will be watching uh, with a lot of intent tonight. Yeah, I kind of like Chicago. I, I, a, it's at, in Chicago. It's at home. It's obviously that time of year where it becomes uh, difficult to play in, in an outdoor environment, especially for a team that's used to playing uh, where the Cowboys do play. Uh, so you have that. And then the part I, I think the Bears have kind of figured out a formula. They still have a good defense. It's not as good as it was with Big Fangio, but it's still uh, certainly – uh, top 10 in the league in, in that range, and they've sort of found a formula with Mitchell Trubisky to just, you know, manage the game, uh, don't turn the football over, maybe make a couple of throws late in the game, and they've been winning that way. I, I think they'll be able to do it again. I, I just think the Cowboys are kind of off the rails, and they're just not playing well. All right. Uh, of course, uh, we have that game tonight. Let's go to today's injury report for the Eagles. By the way, before we get to that, if Dallas loses tonight, what is the ramifications and the perks, I guess, for Philadelphia? Uh, and what does it – I mean, I guess it allows them to slip up on Monday night as well, correct? Well, you know, it's interesting because Doug Peterson talked today and he said there's no margin for error any longer. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I mean, if the Cowboys keep losing, and remember, it's not only Chicago. They also have that Rams team I was talking about, which still has uh, still a pretty good team, not as good as they were, uh, but they still have uh, goals to play for. 
uh, even though the landscape is difficult for them as well. And then the Eagles as well, which obviously Eagles Cowboys will more likely than not be the game that decides the NFC East championship. But we'll have to see as these weeks unfold. Um, yeah, I mean, there shouldn't be a margin of error, but we've talked about it all week. This division is so bad, there might be a margin of error. And that's kind of sad. All right, uh, let's look at the injury report today. Um, Aguilar, Derek Barnett, Camus, I guess the big one is Jordan Howard, and uh, he was limited today. But uh, kind of give us the shakedown specifically on Howard and if you know anything more on the other three guys. Well, Camus is the most interesting because he talked to us yesterday in the locker room, seemed fine, and all of a sudden he showed up uh, with a concussion on the injury report, which means he's in the protocol. So uh, now he's not going to talk because he's in the protocol. It'll be interesting when we get to talk to Doug, which won't happen again until Saturday uh, because it's a Monday night game if he suffered that concussion in practice because there's no evidence that it came from the game. Uh, so that's the most interesting uh, injury and, and uh, as far as what is ag- exactly going on with Camus. Jordan Howard, it's status quo. He's been limited for four weeks. Uh, he's not cleared for contact still. And it seems like every press conference we have, Doug, is this a season-ending injury, or can this be a season-ending injury? And he says, no, it's not. Well, I mean, we only got four games left. It's looking like he's going to miss another game. So it's certainly not trending in a positive direction, and I think that's a big deal because post-Deshaun Jackson, this team finally found an offensive identity with Jordan Howard as the lead back. Since he went down, it's no coincidence they've lost three consecutive games. They no longer have an identity on offense. And I think it's directly related to not having Jordan Howard. So that, that's a big, big injury. Where, John, where do they go from here without Jordan? If, if he doesn't play Monday night, they're kind of in the same situation. I mean, I know Ajayi had an eight-yard run, but he just does not look like a guy who can handle or should handle the ball nine or ten times. And we know that Doug, when his back against the wall, does kind of like to recalibrate and go back to the run game. But outside of Miles Sanders, who does Doug lean on to be that counterpart? Well, yeah, I, I, I don't think I have a counterpart. I think that's the problem. I think you're right with Jay Ajayi. Anybody who saw him at – that the explosion is just not there. It's pretty clear why it took him so long to, to get back and sign with the team. Ended up resigning with the Eagles after 13 months. Uh, he certainly doesn't look like the same guy physically, so I'm not sure if they have anything to count on there. And then you would have to go to somebody like Boston Scott. It's pretty evident they don't have that much confidence in him. So it it really comes down to Miles Sanders, and it's pretty evident to me that they don't want him to touch the ball 25 times for whatever reason. And and weirdly, Uh, if you look at Boston Scott's numbers, and I get it, you know, he hasn't done much in this league to prove that he can do everything, but, you know, Ryan and I were going through before, his numbers are pretty good this year. I mean, he's not like a power back, but in the absence of anybody else to handle the ball, it seems like Doug's either going to just pass more or have to trust a running back that he doesn't love and his modest operandi is, I'll just pass more. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Trust seems to be a big deal with this coach and young players. And we've talked about it a lot more so involving J.J. or Sega Whiteside. But I think to a lesser degree, there's a trust issue with Miles Sanders as well. And I think it has more to do with pass protection and – the passing game, which will surprise people because he's been so effective Mm -hmm. at times with explosive plays as a receiver. But it was two weeks ago where Doug kind of threw this out there in uh, uh, a roundabout fashion. And he said, and Miles has got to be in the right spot as a receiver. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that was an indication that he was not in the right spot at times. Uh, And that's very important as an outlet receiver because if you're a quarterback and you're going through your progression, 
that last brush in that outlet is sort of a, a that's something you already have in your head. You understand, okay, if everything else goes to you know what, the running back or the tight end is going to be here and you just dump it off. And if he's not where he's supposed to be, uh, bad things can happen. So I think that's where the trust issues stem from. But I also say, and I said this with JJ, sometimes you got to live with mistakes by young players. And mm-hmm. if you don't have anything else, and they don't have anything else at the running back position, and Miles is effective from a physical standpoint. He's obviously very athletic. He's obviously put up numbers uh, from a standpoint of yards per carry. We all know about the receiving yards. You got to throw them out there, and you got to use them. Yeah, and you got to live with uh, the I, I butchered one of your favorite McMullenisms before when I said the same thing. I was agreeing with you, but I accidentally said you got to throw the baby in the deep end of the pool. And that's, <laughs> <laughs> as a parent of two children, I caught myself in the middle of saying that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, I've, I've felt that way earlier in the year about even Miles. I felt that they were trying to gradually work him in instead of living with whatever mistake. You know, you needed explosive plays. You're gradually working in one of your more explosive players. And I agree with you on JJ. I mean, it both in both cases, it's led to bad product and, bad, and it's looked bad on the coaches. And yet it seems like they're so stubborn that they're going to walk that road anyway. I feel like in the past, the yeah, offensive well, line and the, is and the frustrating, went... frustrating part from uh, a J.J. Artega Whiteside perspective is that you get to that point anyway where, yeah. you know, Max failed so spectacularly. Now you're already played 12 games, and now you have to throw J.J. out there, and you have to live with mistakes early, late in the season. Wouldn't you rather have those mistakes early in the season and maybe he gets over them? I, I, I think it is a – or at least it should be a, a a learning point for this coach and this coaching staff, and we'll see if they learn from it. I mean, every team plays young players, plays rookies, and, and some people accept the mistakes that are going to be involved, and some don't. And I, I think that's the issue. I think they have to uh, they have to accept the mistakes and just live with them. Yeah, I feel like coaches. I, I hate that that reasoning of trust because. From the player standpoint, it's like, well, let me prove it to you. <laughs> it's like coaches either f- like feel comfortable with a player or they don't, and you can tell when they don't, and they'll use the trust thing as an excuse oftentimes. But the bottom line is they're not ready to put him in a certain position yet when they really could put others you know, in a position that are just as young, maybe in different areas. But what about the offensive line? John, because we've heard stories in the past of Lane Johnson and Jason Kelsey going into the coach's office and saying, trust us, run the ball. And where's any of that? How are the, How's that group feeling about the play calling and everything that's going on? Well, uh, I, uh, there was a change today in the schedule. So, uh, I mean, the Eagles were supposed to practice uh, until 2.20. Uh, they extended it to, to about 3 o'clock, just before 3 o'clock. And they put the pads on. Uh, and they weren't supposed to put the pads on. So that was sort of the, the I, I don't want to call it a message, because I think part of it was the leadership council from the team's perspective coming off this horrible Miami loss. Uh, they They wanted to send a message that there's still goals to be accomplished and that It's not time to give up on the season. It's time to get tougher. You can't have these types of games against inferior opponents because so many inferior opponents are coming up. Uh, But I I haven't heard them express any ill will towards the play calling or anything of that nature. And maybe that is partially protecting uh, the quarterback as well because you don't want to put the face of the franchise in that position. So I think veteran players are smart enough to not do that but anybody who's ever met an offensive lineman especially an offensive lineman that like Lane Johnson Brandon Brooks dominant powerful guys they want to run the football they always want to run football so that's kind of baked into their thinking John there was a uh, there was just a question that was uh, you know they were asking about McVay and whether him finally kind of saying you know what I got Gurley let's kind of get back to Gurley has kind of helped them 
you know, they, they weren't playing well, the Rams, and all of a sudden they've won a couple games in a row and they've utilized Gurley more, something they really weren't doing. Now, a lot of people looked at Gurley and said he looked like he was he was cooked. He wasn't the same guy. So was he not the same guy or was McVay just not using him? And now that they are going back and leaning on Gurley more, you know, is it kind of showing that sometimes these coaches outthink themselves? Well, I, I don't know because Todd's got a, a degenerative knee condition. I mean, that's real. So, so maybe I haven't heard the question asked. I'm sure it was asked to Sean McVay at some point. Maybe they did have him on a bit of a pitch count early in the season uh, for that reason, to have him uh, to be able to use him more late. I don't know if that was their strategy, but it would make some sense in theory. Uh, if you use him a ton early in the season, maybe you're you're in a better spot, though. So you kind of juggle that each way and see uh, how you can be successful one way or another. I, I prefer to use a player if you have a player. I mean, and Jim Schwartz talks about this a lot. There's only 16 of these things. It's not the NBA. It's not Major League Baseball where you have all these games. Week one, in a lot of ways, is just as important as week 17. And if you do get out to a good start and say you are 10-2 and two by this point, well, then there are so many good things that come out of that. You generate confidence in other players, and you just have that season. You have those special seasons. And, and confidence is a big part of it from a player's perspective. And all of a sudden, if you're 10-2 and two and you don't have a player like that, maybe somebody steps up and you saw it with the Eagles here. How many injuries did they overcome en route to the Super Bowl? Uh, and they had so much confidence in that season. So I, I believe in using players if they're healthy and if they're cleared. But I, I do see some value if, if, if you have a player – on a pitch count to try to keep them as healthy as possible for later in the season. Uh, what is your take? Now, yesterday, you know, you indicated that you thought Grow was and, and that the Eagles, there was a disconnect. Uh, today, Peterson was kind of bombarded early with questions about the Mac Hollins. And see where you started, John? See, the, see if you can read the tweets <laughs> on whether Doug Peterson was uh, a little disheartened by them releasing Mac Hollins or not. Well, and I said, I, I, I don't know if it was necessarily Matt Collins. I, I think it was more Andrew Sandeo. I think that was the first part. That was the first linchpin of it uh, because I heard that from – Should have been L.J. Ford, player. to be honest. Yeah, L.J. as well, <laughs> maybe even before. Uh, but the defensive coaching staff was, not, was expecting to have Sandejo. Uh He was an important part of the fan base, doesn't – Care doesn't understand, doesn't like that player, but uh, they felt he was an important part of, of what they were putting together, and so did his teammates. Uh, so they were a little blindsided by that. And I, but, and I, as I said, I don't necessarily disagree with uh, Howie Roseman's decision because I, I think once it becomes clear that you're not as good as you thought you were, well, probably the fourth-round pick you're likely to get is, is more valuable uh, than a 32-year-old safety who's not going to be back next year anyway. Uh, if you were 10-2, and two, you'd probably want that 32-year-old safety to make the defense coordinator happy. Uh, so that was the first part of it. And, it, look, for the first time, and I, and I always say about Doug Peterson, this is rare. When you have a Super Bowl winning coach who has not grabbed for more personnel power, it, it, it usually doesn't happen. Uh, and he's been egoless to that to this point. But is that because he's egoless, or is that because when he first got the job, remember he didn't have the cachet to ask for anything? Not a coaching staff, not personnel power. So that's why he didn't get it originally. Then when he won the Super Bowl, the perception was well, this team has great personnel, so there's nothing to complain about. Now we're at the first point where you're starting to ask yourself, what the heck is going on with some of these personnel decisions? And to me, it's just a natural step, and, and Jeff can probably explain this as well. This happens all over the league when coaches have success. Mm -hmm. And it's the old Bill Parcells mentality. If, if yeah. you want me to cook the meal, let me buy the groceries. Right. Every coach gets to that point 
if they're successful. And Doug will get to that point. I guarantee it. What do you think the building's going to look like Monday night? Well, I haven't looked at the weather. Rain. 90% chance of rain. Yeah, and if it's going to be cold and rainy, I think there's going to be a lot of empty seats. And I think that has more to do with the modern NFL, modern sports in general. You see empty seats late in the season. People talk about the NFL as popular, the television ratings. When teams are out of it, this stuff is so expensive. And people start dumping I feel like the Eagles, days. though, have kind of been like, uh, you know. Well, that's because they've been successful. Yeah, well, and, and, you know, when it got to the end of the chip, that place was empty, and then chip was gone. When it got to the end of the Andy, that place was empty, and then Andy was gone. And I'm not suggesting that if it's empty Monday night, but what if they lose Monday and then Washington, and they play a game against Dallas with a building that's 75 to 50% full? I don't think any of us think that Doug is in any trouble, but would that send off some red flags? I think it would, but in a different direction. I think you'd see wholesale changes on the coaching staff. I, I don't think Doug is in any danger whatsoever. Uh, I don't think Howie's in any danger whatsoever. Uh, the only thing that could change that is, is if those two start fighting. And, and I mean, I mean, uh, it's always in, in an obvious <laughs> I, I mean, in an obvious fashion where they're leaking things and it's clear that they're not on the same page. And I, I don't think we're at that stage yet. All right, John McMullen at JF McMullen. Tomorrow, Monday, more on this game. Big one. We got the game tonight, Dallas and the Bears, real big one. And then, of course, Monday night, Eagles, Giants, and uh, Eli Manning. Looks like he's going to get an opportunity to maybe uh, get those Eagle fans one last time. He's probably licking his chops at that opportunity. By the way, the Eagles have beaten them nine out of ten times. I know, but I'm saying this might be the last 21. chance he ever sees them. <laughs> well, he might see them in week 17 as well. Who knows? It's oh, a high possible. ankle sprain. That could, that right. could last a long time. Uh, all right, Johnny Mack, we'll talk again tomorrow. All right, thanks, guys. Football at four in the books again for the Thursday edition. <laughs>